with this deep acknowledgement of our embeddedness with each other and with our physical world, where we are dependent upon each other for survival. The true connections that we have with each other are the things that define who we are. And so we have an enormous individual responsibility. How we choose to spend our time, the resources we consume, the heart print we bring forward is of enormous consequence. Welcome to Mind and Life. I'm Wendy Hasenkamp. Today I'm speaking with neuroscientist and contemplative researcher Cliff Saren. Cliff is a pioneer in studying the effects of meditation on attention and emotion. And he's been deeply embedded in the field of contemplative science since the earliest days. He's also an advocate for nuance, complexity, and mystery, things which often get lost in today's world of sound bites and clickbait. And so, perhaps not surprisingly, this conversation goes deep. We begin by exploring Cliff's winding path into contemplative research, including connections along the way with folks like Richie Davidson, Evan Thompson, Francisco Varela, and the Dalai Lama. We then talk about some of his early work studying how brain signals can predict behavior. And this gets us into the murky territory of free will and some of the implications there. Cliff then describes the work he's perhaps best known for, the longitudinal study on meditation called the Shamatha Project. Still, I believe the longest running research project that's ever been done on meditation. And we get into some of the findings that are emerging. Specifically, we talk about the effects of a three-month meditation retreat on attention, markers of cellular aging, and purpose in life. Along the way, we discuss the importance of context in meditation research, and Cliff also describes recent efforts to recruit and work with more diverse populations and how that experience has changed the way he thinks about research. We also talk about communicating the nuance and uncertainty that's inherent in scientific endeavors and challenges with the media and the state of public education and science. And Cliff ends with a reflection on the African concept of Ubuntu, the idea that I am because you are, and the importance of embracing our interdependence. As always, there's lots more information in the show notes with links to papers and lectures from Cliff. And for those who are interested in the research, there's a podcast extra this week with some pretty fascinating scientific findings on how meditation affects the way we respond to the suffering of others. Before I sign off, I'll just share that this marks the end of yet another season of the show. I have to say, it's been really cool to see how over time we're building a kind of digital archive with these episodes that's telling the fuller story of contemplative science and what we're learning about our minds through these different ways of knowing. We now have over 30 episodes, so if you're newer to the show, you may want to go back and check out some earlier conversations. There's a lot of deep wisdom there to explore. We'll be back with season four in just a couple months, and keep an eye on your feeds in the meantime, as we may drop something in there before then. And thank you for listening and for your feedback and your support. It's been just amazing to see our audience grow, and we're thrilled that so many of you are finding these conversations valuable. I hope you all have wonderful holidays and that 2022 is full of joy and peace and healing and connection. And I hope this episode brings some joy as well. It's my great pleasure to share with you Cliff Saren. Welcome, Cliff. It is so wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us. It is a pleasure to be here, Wendy. Really thankful for this opportunity. You have really been in this field since the very early days, and so I'm excited to get your perspective on how things have unfolded. And um, as I think you know, I usually just start with a little bit of history uh, from the guest and your own personal story. So I would love to hear how you got interested in meditation and, and how you came into the field of contemplative science. Sure. There's a, a certain way in which 
I was a bit born into this. And there are a number of strands that really figured quite formatively in my interest in meditation and in science. About five months before I was born, my father's brother committed suicide, mm. consequent to receiving what turned out to be neurotoxic experimental medications mm. as part of the project MK Ultra. Oh, wow. I did not learn of this till I was 18. Mm. But I was raised with a very complex relationship with science because of a certain almost deification of it on the part of my father, bringing his brother who had childhood diabetes and some psychiatric issues consequent to it, to the experts in the early 1950s mm. when the CIA was funding these experiments. Right. Wormwood is a series on Netflix, a documentary series about, about that program. After his brother died, my father tried from a background in electrical engineering and radio to understand the human mind, to try to make sense of what happened to his brother. Mm. That was the same time the Josiah Macy Foundation conferences that created the field of neuroscience were happening, as well as the early emergence of humanistic and existential psychology at the New School and my father went from electrical engineering as a day job and working in television to being a kind of self-educated student of this emerging field and got to know the leaders at that time. Hmm. And I'm an infant, but I began hearing about neurotransmitters in elementary school. <laughs> wow. At the same time, I turned out to be a very asthmatic child. And I spent a great deal of my childhood sick in struggling to breathe and really coming close to death several times. Mm. One time I remember getting very peaceful when I was told I was somewhat blue being wheeled into an emergency room mm. around age nine. Another instance of medical wisdom, said sarcastically, <laughs> was that the experts on childhood allergy and asthma in the early 1950s suggested if a child didn't do well in New York, they be removed from their parents' care and taken to the Denver School for Asthmatic Children. Mm. So my parents had a sort of Damocles, so to speak, hanging over my health and my presence. Mm. In this mix, I came to, just as a child, understand a close relationship between my emotional state and my relaxation and my ability to breathe. And so I wound up spending a lot of time doing what I later learned was mindfulness of breathing right. in a certain respect. When I would go to summer camp, invariably the mold would cause me to have acute asthma and mm. I couldn't participate. But what I remember is sitting after getting a, an oil-based subcutaneous injection of adrenaline, is sitting by the screen window in the infirmary, breathing and just being grateful to be alive. Mm. 17 years, 18 years later, I'm sitting at IMS, at the Insight Meditation Society, not far from where I had asthma in summer camps, and I have this kind of flashbulb memory that here I am, sitting by the window, <laughs> watching my breath, <laughs> mm. grateful to be alive. So I have this thread of this complex relationship with science, this phenomenological body of awareness of relations between mind states and health states. And then I was also given a book 
when I was seven, called a cosmic view, the universe in 40 jumps, which was a picture of a girl with polio with a cat in her lap in a wheelchair in a Danish school. And you turn the page and you're 10 meters above her mm. and then 100 meters. And this went all the way out to them saying, each dot's a galaxy and printing doesn't allow us to make a denser page than this. Mm -hmm. And you turn the page and you go down to the radius of the hydrogen atom. I could not stop <laughs> being engaged with this book because it was telling me reality is organized across multiple scales. And this was the book that was the inspiration for Powers of Ten that Charles and Ray Eames made the movie that Scientific right. American published as a book that then NSF funded as an IMAX movie called Cosmic Voyage. But this was a, a recurrent motif of always wanting to drill down and pull back. Mm. So this informed going on to, to college and studying biology. But in the middle of all this, I began going to conferences at humanistic psychology meetings, as well as to scientific conferences at MIT on biophysics. And I'm still in high school. So in the middle of all this, Ram Dass shows up on the radio, mm. and I'm into recording sound, and I wind up recording Ram Dass, uh, for WBAI, the Pacifica radio station in New York. It just so happens? Well, my dad sort of was at NBC, and he sometimes helped get materials, magnetic tape and stuff uh -huh. for the Pacifica. But I mean, with Ram Dass, you didn't choose... To record him, you were just asked to do something. No, I chose. I mean, I'm. I was listening to his teachings because in the background of this strange childhood was also Alan Watts and Krishnamurti. And because I was asthmatic and I did not dare not smoke marijuana with my compatriots, I used to listen to Indian music <laughs> and think about how this sonic embodiment of some sense of the divine in a very nonlinear way was a human expression of potential. So the human potential movement, the nascent interest in psychology and brain studies were all present even before I went to college. And in college, I found it really hard to keep up with the pre-med students, but I was still going to humanistic psychology conferences in the summers. And in 1973, I, I met a graduate student in Toronto at the Association for Humanistic Psychology, <laughs> whose name is Richie Davidson. Mm. And we became friends, and I wound up working with him for 14 years on a daily basis, <gasps> building his laboratory and taking the skills I had from sound recording and applying it to brainwave recording. And simultaneously, I was um, learning a bit about filmmaking, and I was interested in other cultures and studying more rigorously religion uh, from the Hindu philosophy side, along with being a bio major. And uh, this sort of set me up to meet Chogyam Trungpa when he came to Harvard Divinity School to announce Naropa. So I went to that fateful first summer in 1974 for 10 weeks. And at Naropa, this new Buddhist university, I met Joseph Goldstein. And his articulation of paying close attention to experience, close attention to intention, landed for me as a simultaneity of points of view I had from psychology, from neuroscience, and from spiritual experience. And there was a simplicity about this that was a great release. Mm. At Naropa, I was, um, in addition to Joseph Goldstein, deeply touched by the presence of Gregory Bateson. Mm. And in Gregory, I found a kind of intellectual father. And sort of his watchwords are the pattern that connects. And I think 
that's one of the touchstones to link across all these different levels of organization of reality. So I was in his classes. And then in the summer of 1975, Evan's father. Evan Thompson. Right. Yeah. He hosted at Lindisfarne a wonderful meeting with Jonas Salk and with Pierre Vilayat Khan, with Gregory, and with someone I hadn't met yet, Francisco Varela. Hmm. And we have some of this story, too, previously on the podcast with Evan as well. So the early Lindisfarne, yeah. Right. So Evan was a tweener, I think. Mm-hmm. He, he was, you know, under 14 when I first met him. So in that sense, that was a, a transformative week because it provided a consolidation of many of these strands so that when I went back to, to school... I could be involved in research within the context of a forming spiritual community that had a very open-handed and holistic sense of what research could be mm. in the midst of how primitive our tools were. And I wound up living in David McClellan's house. He was chair of psychology and social relations at Harvard, very famous scholar of motivation, and um, did a research project with Richie and him on uh, power motivation in Harvard undergraduates. <laughs> <laughs> Working for David McClelland, who is Mr. Motivation, was something where he became the kind of ultimate enlightened boss. Hmm. And I just saw the benefit of focused work and being in the stream of research. And that's what situated me to join Richie in his lab. Mm. And at SUNY Purchase, where we were for the first nine years, there was actually a kind of uh, wave back and forth from IMS to the lab. I would do retreats every vacation. And Jack Cornfield and Joseph Goldstein came to Purchase and did weekends with us. And there was... <laughs> That's so interesting, because this is well before there was ever any research in the lab around meditation, right? Right. This was all very meaningful to us personally. Mm -hmm. And there was this persistent, how do you integrate the thing itself that touches one so deeply in the silence of a contemplative retreat in your daily life? Mm -hmm. So having done these retreats and then being immersed in the lab, there began to be a confusion as to was I on retreat in the lab or on in the lab on retreat? Mm. Because they begin to be less separable mm -hmm. as a motif. Around this time, I have met my girlfriend, who is now my wife, Barbara, who's a cellist, a musician, and doing retreats every vacation uh, are taking a back seat to being with her and her family on vacation. Yeah. And then of course this has come full circle since we teach together how cello practice is a kind of mindfulness practice is a kind of investigation that overlaps with the art of doing science. So eventually I need to go to graduate school because I never went to graduate school. I did 14 years as a kind of research technician, mm. research associate, you know, adjunct-ish mm -hmm. faculty for teaching. But I knew that a PhD was inescapable in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. But I put it off as long as I possibly <laughs> could. In 1978, I had a unique in my life experience with respect to a scientific presentation. The man who became my mentor in graduate school, Herbert Vaughn, gave a talk about being able to understand where things were coming from in the brain by electrical mapping techniques that connected what could be recorded invasively in macaque monkeys with what could be recorded non-invasively at the surface of the skull. Mm -hmm. And it blew my mind. And so I wound up becoming his last graduate student starting graduate school in 1989. So in the fall of 1990, Richie Davidson and I met at 
the psychophysiology meetings in Boston. And I had heard that he was going to a mind and life conference. So he was going to talk with the Dalai Lama. Mm-hmm. So I said to him, so are you all excited? And he said, I can't go. Mm. He had a family medical emergency and two small children. And then there was this spark in his eye. He said, do you want to go to Dharamsala? <laughs> and three weeks later, I was presenting at Mind and Life 3. My goodness. And rooming with Francisco. <laughs> and that experience was a bend in my river that has not unbent. Can you talk a little bit more about that meeting and what it was about and how it shaped you? So that that meeting is uh, published in a book called Healing Emotions. And it was essentially mind states, brain states, and health. And I was there to present work relating to psychobiology of different emotional uh, states and personality types and immune system responses as a function of emotional baseline personality characteristics. It wasn't based on studying meditation. Mm -hmm. And the experience of presenting this material to His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, was really unique. Because you could feel his attention as almost like a a tractor beam, Mm. if you will. And any sentence that you said, if you made space in your delivery would result in his picking up the idea, rotating it, seeing if you could see it from a different angle, acknowledging the idea, and putting it down, Mm. and then being ready for the next (laughs) aliquot of intellect. So 31 years later, this is November 1990, it's still a palpable memory Mm. of that quality of kind attention with a certain kind of stability and no rush. So in some sense, each part of an argument, each reveal of a fact was building a case and a picture. Mm -hmm. And in order to see the picture when one finishes the discourse, you need to hold all of this in mind. Mm -hmm. It was at this meeting that at two in the morning, at some night, Francisco said, we were too old EEGers, we should do something. (laughs) And that was the genesis of the subsequent research project that we did with the monks in the hills of Baksu Mountain in 1992. Oh, wow. With Alan Wallace, and Richie, and uh, Francisco, and Greg Simpson, and others. And there, in dialogue with several of the monks who were in retreat, we had time to hear about a view of compassion that unalterably affected our motivation for the, till now. Hmm. Particularly from one conversation and one afternoon, I have the MP3s on my laptop from the cassettes I recorded, which you can hear the birds and the goats in the background. On the question of what is the relationship between sadness and compassion? Mm. This is a monk named Geshe Toki. And he spoke that one needed to find the suffering of another simultaneously unbearable and yet find a way to love the conditions that gave rise to that, almost the way a mother loves a child, Mm. to penetrate into the nature of causes and conditions so that you kind of get an exploded 3D diagram of the present moment. Hmm. 
and see where you can bring benefit. So if you can manifest insight into some sense of chains of causality, you may be guided to do a more skillful thing than the first impulse. Mm. It's making me think of what you said about the, uh, what was it, 40 jumps to the cosmos? Yes, cosmic view, the universe in 40 jumps. Yeah, which just, you know, I think so much about interdependence at all those levels, right? And I, I hear the same conclusion out of thinking of the interdependence of all the causes and conditions that lead to any moment and how understanding that can lead to more compassion. Is that kind of what you mean? Mm-hmm. So I eventually went back and uh, graduated doing a dissertation inspired by those monks, but on something entirely different at first glance, which was visuomotor integration and interhemispheric transfer across the corpus callosum, hmm. which has already appeared, I think, in this podcast. <laughs> this was uh, Andreas did an experiment. Um, like this. Right, right. Andreas Ropstorff shared a story of uh, working in the fMRI as an anthropologist. <laughs> right. But I wanted to understand intra-individual differences, how one's response to a stimulus is different moment to moment hmm. mm -hmm. with the same physical, the same ostensible input. Right. So I'd been very influenced by an Israeli neuroscientist, Amosh Ariely, who actually had an insight on a meditation retreat by noticing how sound is different. You know, if you hear the radiator creaking mm -hmm. and you're meditating, it doesn't always sound the same, mm -hmm. even if the pipe is banging the same. Right. Or the ticking of a clock. If you're paying really close attention to your auditory experience, you will see that Sometimes the tick is barely audible. Right. What changed? Well, your brain state changed. And so he went on to do seminal work that was published in science and has been cited many, many hundreds of times, looking at the brain activity in cat visual cortex one second before a flash that can account for almost 80% of the variability of the response to the flash. Mm. So the brain state before you even encounter a stimulus is shaping the way that you respond. Exactly. Neural context. Mm -hmm. So this, again, is in this theme of nested levels of analysis mm -hmm. or organization. So on a sub-second time scale, there is alteration in the consequences of any particular input. Mm-hmm. So I had people uh, sit for nine hours lifting their finger <laughs> off thousands of simple flashes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but then I analyzed it as a function of the spontaneous fluctuation mm -hmm. of their reaction times. Right. And we're able to map very different pathways of cortical activation, depending upon whether you're going to be fast or slow. This is fascinating. Can I take a little tangent here for a moment? Sure. <laughs> that might be more than a moment. But um, this is something that's really fascinated me just with relation to our subjective experience and um, also the issue of free will, which I imagine you've thought a lot about and I can see you cringing. <laughs> but um, It's a smile cringe. Yes. So uh, I'm just curious how you think about it and it might be more in depth than we want to get into right now, but given all of your work and knowledge about how a given brain state will condition the next brain state, I guess uh, you could say, and shape the kind of incoming stimuli, this to me goes right along with what you were saying before about causes and conditions leading to the way that things are. So somewhere in there, do you think there's any room for this idea of free will or... How do you think about that? Thank you for this question. <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, said with with uh, sort of a graph going up with gratefulness and a graph going down with. <laughs> <laughs> I have the same feeling now. I I almost didn't ask it, but. <laughs> so I think about this a fair amount. 
because you have to say there can be change and there can be learning mm -hmm. and there can be development and there is development. So what is the relationship between uh, conscious intention, deliberativeness, and uh, from a neuroscientific point of view, a bit of an illusion of free will? Mm -hmm. And I think that if we roll way back, we're fundamentally just making machines. Just right? making. Just making. Mm. We forget so much of yesterday during a, a good night's sleep. We coalesce and condense and confabulate meaning in our everyday lives. And we act with the experience of autonomy often. But I am so moved by the proportion of our existence that is below conscious awareness mm -hmm. that I cannot escape thinking about it as a large presence. You know, there, there was, um, Ray Kiel talked about uh, the default mode is the dark matter of the brain, mm -hmm. but I think this is even more dark matter, that this is a pervasive lack of access. Mm -hmm. Because if we had to think of every planful moment for every step, every time we catch a ball, every time we lift a cup, every time we try to utter a word, the lack of automaticity would get us totally bollocksed up and we wouldn't get to square one. Right. So we have a way in which experience presents itself as full of choices. And the rhetoric around contemplative practice is often enhancing this space mm -hmm. of choice. Mm -hmm. I think about it more like a movement toward a different kind of automaticity. Hmm. And that arises from practice in a very large and loose sense of the word practice because it overlaps with commitments to values. It overlaps with the learning from painful experiences and making mistakes. It overlaps with the impact of wise words of others. It impacts from knowing what it might be that, that we are if we are as embedded as I think we are in each other. So when I sometimes talk about uh, the function of uh, sitting or doing mindfulness of breathing, I think of it as a, a way of holding up a window, like putting a stick if the window's going to fall down on its own. Mm -hmm. A technique might be a way to keep that window up a little, but the technique is not the purpose of the time. The purpose of the time seems to be to look through what you see with the window open. And what I think you see is the human condition. Mm. You see your relationships. You see the world as it comes to you. And behind it all is this sense of limitation, of mortality, of preciousness. Free will is a construct that doesn't come from neuroscience. It comes from religion as part of moral teaching. So there may be a logical error to try to map it onto where is the free will area because one's experience conditions one to respond in a way consistent with what one holds dear. And along the way, those acts post hoc inform us what we did. Mm -hmm. Now we know we can find signs of a movement that is volitional way before people are consciously aware they're about to do something from measuring electrophysiology. We are full of what are called corollary discharges that accompany actions and even eye movements. Our conscious experience is constantly being refreshed from an extraordinarily partial set of elements and awarenesses. 
we're sitting in front of screens while simultaneously in our short-term visual working memory, we only have four to six elements of the scene in awareness at once. The whole visual world is actually calving into the ocean the way glaciers uh, break off mm. and go in. So our experience goes. In the midst of what I think this body-mind embedded entity is, there isn't the mechanism for the solidity of the self to consciously choose and manifest what's called free will, yet there is learning. Mm -hmm. There are shifts in probability distributions from complex sets of causes. And as one learns about what makes one feel better, presumably, you make alterations in your environment that are helping you. You know, don't bring cookies into the house and I will look a little more svelte. <laughs> Put a Buddha on a table and a glance will include what such statuary could represent. So this investigating the mind icon enters this calving process. And now my refresh includes that. Right. Same with people who one cares about. Same, I mean, why do we create nests full of things that remind us of our center? You're smiling, right? <laughs> I appreciate your explanation and perspective on it, on this question. I mean, it's not a question that's really easily answerable, of course, but I also really like that you raised that free will is a really more of a religious construct. And so it's maybe not even of the purview necessarily of neuroscience, or it's not, um, you just think about it differently from the perspective of a brain and, and causality states. So thank, thank you for <laughs> it's going down that rabbit hole with me. <laughs> a pleasure. Yeah. I derailed your, your story. Well, what in terms of the, the move to contemplative science, I finished this dissertation looking at moment-to-moment -moment variations in a single individual in response to a very simple task. All you had to do is lift your finger when you saw a flash as fast as you could. I found that task overwhelming in terms of thinking about what all that came online in order to do the simplest task. And because there was so much intra-individual variability, and I collected a study's worth of data, as I was beginning to explore these patterns of regional activation, sensory motor activity, and then sometimes people would go, ah, shucks, that's the PG reading. <laughs> I forgot to push the button. Uh -huh. And in that sense, what ties the fact of a stimulus to a motor response is short-term working memory and sort of the executive control of this task set. Oh, yeah, I did see something. I better push the button. Mm -hmm. So this made me think that a single person, there's no measure of central tendency. There's no just your reaction time. Mm. It's essentially a rainbow mm -hmm. of multiple processes, even within one experimental condition of just see that flash in that location and push a button. That conditioned me to think about 
neurophysiology and cognitive neuroscience from this kind of almost bottom-up way that we've been talking about, how the, the moment conditions the response. And that, I then realized, was a kind of contemplative gloss on a psychology experiment, like a little sensory motor experiment. Mm. So I'd think of the monks on Baksu Mountain when I'm like spending hundreds of hours analyzing gigabytes of EEG data of graduate students who gave me so much of their brain activity that I induced neuroplasticity just doing the task. Mm -hmm. But it allowed me to get measures of behavior and electric cortical activity with R squares of 0.95. Mm. That is 95% of the variance was accounted for in their behavior by what I hmm. could record from wow. over the motor cortex. And this was the behavior of pressing the button. Yeah, behavior writ very small. The simplest, small. yeah, in the simplest form. So yeah. Lifting your finger. Yeah. It, was, it was actually lift oh, up, lift up from a photo cell. Okay. So into this, this is kind of happening while I've done this experiment and all these, this project in Dharamsala. And what am I going to do after I graduate? So Alan Wallace was instrumental in being the translator of worlds between these monks who only spoke Tibetan and our team. But it was clear we needed to do a study longitudinally because these extraordinary monks who had chosen out of many, many hundreds and thousands of monks to be practitioners on retreat could be self-selected. Mm -hmm. And so what is the consequence of training compared to the individual differences of those who had chosen this lifestyle? So there was a new center being developed, an interdisciplinary center that I learned about at UC Davis. So the Center for Mind and Brain became the perfect interdisciplinary launch pad for this idea that Alan had to do a longitudinal study of intensive meditation practice to try to address the issues of uh, self-selectedness that we found with these wonderful monks we spent time with in a context in which we could actually bring our equipment along. Mm -hmm. Originally, Alan wanted to do a three-year retreat <gasps> study. And I said, that's really completely unrealistic. Yeah. Let's do a one-year retreat study. <laughs> that's already quite... Uh... So that was my unrealism. Yeah. But it got us thinking about tracking the in intra-individual dynamics of psychological and perceptual emotional change across a long period of time. Because the question is, what's the control group mm -hmm. if you have a year of retreat experience? And Alan was focused on a type of practice called shamatha, meditative quiescence. So there, there were three techniques that, that Alan taught one was traditional mindfulness of breathing with an emphasis on staying with the tactile sensations of the breath. Mm -hmm. And when your mind wanders, gently bringing it back and then moving to what he called settling the mind in its natural state, which is essentially if you could find the focus of attention that is your mind's eye and rest your attention there, sort of take your seat at the omnimax of everything that arises. Mm. And within that uh, frame, the third technique was awareness of awareness itself, looking for the invariance that is present in every moment of experience, called shamatha without a sign. Mm -hmm. Most people in our project did the mindfulness of breathing, the bulk of it. So ultimately, the issue of a control group and wanting to do a shorter pilot study, three months of intensive practice, became something that we could float to funding agencies and were very generously supported by many, and the Fetzer Institute and 
Larry Hershey and the Hershey Family Foundation were instrumental in getting this off the ground. And so we put together a whole team of dozens of investigators, and we spent at Davis, oh, two years thinking about all the domains of experience that might be impacted by intensive retreat experience. And that gave rise ultimately to something in 2007. We ran at the Shambhala Mountain Center as the Shamada Project. Right. Which is still, I think, to this day, the longest longitudinal study of meditation that's ever been done. Is that right? Well, we include data for seven-year follow-ups that uh, we have published. And I uh, sort of am the orchestra conductor of an extraordinary band of scientists and trainees and students. And we have still publishing to this day uh, results from that study and uh, dissertations are still drawing on it as we speak. Yeah. And that was another bend in the life river to do that study because we built two state-of-the-art EEG laboratories, psychophysiology laboratories in uh, the basement of a meditation hall in the Rockies. Right. And uh, had two groups of 30 folks about, each do three months of training. And the folks who were in the waitlist control group, we flew them out to be tested at the retreat center after living for several days uh, in similar housing at the same altitude. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they went on to do their own three-month retreat, three months after the end of the first retreat. So I know you've published a host of papers, as you said, on on this project. Do you want to share some of the highlights of things that you found from this study? So we have a number of findings. I think it's really important to contextualize when you hear about some of the things we found, what exactly the relationship is of meditation practice compared to retreat experience Mm -hmm. is really important. In addition, specific meditation techniques, to me, may be, they're definitely coexisting with the overt behavioral change instantiated by doing the practice. So Paul Grossman and I, many, many years ago, at the Summer Institute of Mind and Life, came up with this phrase, the tuchis effect, (laughs) which is Yiddish for sitting on your bum. Mm -hmm. So if you sit for six, eight, ten hours a day with your eyes closed and you refrain from talking, you refrain from imbibing media, you're not reading particularly, you're in a beautiful natural environment, you're with a group of like-minded individuals, You're in the presence of a charismatic and respected teacher. The demand characteristics of that setup are profound. Demand characteristics, just to explain being... Sure. Demand characteristics are the features of an environment that create expectations, and those expectations may be unconscious as well as conscious. So if you know you're being studied, then you may pay more attention to your engagement with the tasks. Mm -hmm. Because if you're being studied in the context of a meditation retreat for the purpose of using science to enhance the validity of these practices, potentially in a Western, wider world of skeptical regard, well, just being in the study is an impact, has an impact. But also, the worldview of the teacher has an impact. Also, the religious framing of a practitioner or their spiritual goal. So when I say demand characteristics, I mean it in the largest sense that we typically in psych experiments, you know, how how the experimenter is relating to you and and the way... uh, Things are presented, and those are certain demand characteristics, or the items on a questionnaire have, may induce a certain kind of response bias. Here, there are so many layers that are coming to bear 
on a person's experience if they just enter a hall. And in a Tibetan Buddhist context, the role of the guru in becoming the guru and deity yoga occurring simultaneously with this as advertised non-religious project Mm. turns out to be quite complicated from an anthropological view, sociological view. So, a few things that that we found. One of the first papers we published um, in Psych Science, the first author was Catherine McLean, was uh, that attention, sustained attention, in terms of vigilance, appeared to improve, which is what we hypothesized. Yeah. But what's really interesting is that we made a very boring task. You just had to tell uh, whether a line was a long line or short. And we made the short line right at your visual perceptual threshold. We'd set that for each person individually. So 25% of the time, you couldn't tell. Okay, so for each person, before you do the task, you test whether they can discriminate between the length of two very similar lines. Like, is this one a tiny bit shorter than that one, or are they the same? Mm -hmm. And this ability to discriminate differs between people. So for each person, when it gets to a length that they're only correct 75% of the time, that's the length that becomes the short line for them for the task. So it's really hard to tell. Yes, right. And then during the task, they just have to press a button every time they see the short line versus the long line. Is that right? Exactly. And the short target line only happened 10% of the time. So for half an hour, every one or two seconds, you're getting a line and only 10% of the time you're supposed to push a button. For the short line. For the short line. And the short line is barely perceptible. Right. And we adjusted the the length of the line at the pre, mid, and post time point. And at the end of the first retreat, we didn't find any improvement in these folks who did a 900-hour intervention. Mm. After three months. But we did notice that their visual perceptual threshold systematically improved. So we were actually making the task harder along the way. Because you kept adjusting the length. So we kept adjusting it. So we then, in the second retreat, we fixed it at the pre. And then there, we saw improvements in vigilance across time Mm. for pretty much in the first 15 minutes of this uh, 30-minute block. Mm -hmm. But it begs the question, was attention better or was perception better? And how are perception and attention interleaved? Yeah. Or did working memory improve so that you could hold on to the sensory trace of that short last time you saw a short line? or the template that was developing of what incontrovertibly is a long line. So you begin again to think about the simplest of these tasks and how complex and cognitive, so to speak, they are. Mm -hmm. So that was one finding. And just in, uh, I think, 2019, Tony Zanesco was first author of a, a paper of the electrocortical activity associated with this kind of a task from brainwave evoked potentials. And he showed the systematic improvements in this sense of electrocortical science of vigilance mm. in the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience. We took this task and we flipped it on its head. And now we said, press the button every time it's not a target. The long line. The long line. Every time you see a long line, 90% of the time, press it. When it's a short line, don't press it. (laughs) So now it's a withholding of response. Yeah, this is like the Listerine test, the taste you hate twice a day. (laughs) It is so infuriating 
but it is such an interesting task because you can actually do this task and become aware that you just failed to inhibit. You could see the short line, mm -hmm. but there goes the finger. Mm -hmm. So it's really an interesting task regarding cognitive control and the separability of these elements of cognition, mm -hmm. response inhibition from perception, and the habitual responding. Because what is a lot of this just making that's wise action, that's compassion, is somehow intimately tied with a capacity to withhold the inappropriate response. Mm, interesting. So what we found is we found that people improved in both retreats on response inhibition over time, and the degree of improvement from the pre-point to the middle of the retreat predicted a joint measure of positive adaptive psychological functioning. Hmm. Say more. So this is published in uh, the journal Emotion. Baljinder Sadra was the first author. It suggests that when you look at a variety of validated self-report measures of well-being, of resilience, of uh, openness to new experience, positive personality characteristics, anxiety, depression, things like this, and you combine all of those into a kind of latent construct of adaptive functioning. Mm -hmm. We notice that this improves at the end of the three-month retreat. To the extent an individual improved in this response inhibition capacity by the midpoint, it predicts their improvement across the three months in this self-report measure. Hmm. So something about the attention or perception or being able to withhold a response is related? Yeah, some, something about the capacity to engage with this response inhibition task and be better at it in the context of the meditation retreat is related to your psychological functioning as indexed by these self-report measures. Mm -hmm. And Tony Zanesco's published a follow-up up to seven years. We kept giving people this task. And so there is interesting data about cognitive aging. Older people in the experiment who meditated more showed less decline over time in the capacity to do this response inhibition task. Mm. So the hopeful interpretation of this relates to improvement in cognitive aging. Right. And that aligns a little bit maybe with some other um, findings you have around telomeres, right, which is related to cellular aging. In the Shamada project, we measured at the end of the three-month retreat the amount of an enzyme called telomerase that helps repair the shortening of your telomeres. Your telomeres are the end caps of your chromosomes. They're the sequence of DNA that is the same in almost all mammals. And we were measuring them in a particular type of blood cell called a peripheral blood monocyte, white blood cell. And the amount of this enzyme was about 30% greater at the end of the three-month retreat than at the end of three months in the control group. But what was really interesting is that it was quite tightly related, again, to psychological change in the participants. Mm. For people who experienced an increased sense of purpose in life, mm. folks for whom their current activities and opportunities and alignments are coincident with their largest goals, that's an evidence of increased purpose in life the high purpose in life. If you're in big transition, you don't know what's happening yet, you haven't manifested your, a way to get to the, your goals, your larger goals, that's a, a lower sense of purpose. Mm. In the retreat, the degree to which people's sense of purpose increased, predicted their telomerase at the end of three months. Hmm. This was published uh, in uh, Psychoneuroimmunology with Tanya Jacobs as the first author. This is in collaboration with Alyssa Eppel and Liz Blackburn uh, at uh, UCSF mm -hmm. and other investigators. So that's a really interesting demonstration of the 
intimate relationship of our minds with our bodies, at, you know, at a cellular level even. There is a fantastic paper that was published, I believe, in PNAS by Alyssa Eppel and Liz Blackburn and their group and Owen Walkowitz about decreased telomere length in mothers of kids with chronic illness mm -hmm. a number of years ago. And the commentary by Robert Sapolsky says, hey guys, the mind gets down to the nucleus. Yeah, absolutely. And you asked about telomeres. Telomeres are actually the length of that DNA segment that gets shorter when cells divide because the DNA replication complex, like a, a zipper at the end of your coat, the zipper isn't teeth all the way down. You need the little piece of slug for the other part of the zipper that does the zipping mm -hmm. to bind, so to speak. Likewise, you can't copy all of your DNA because you can't copy the place where the DNA replication complex is connected. Mm -hmm. You just go down. So you need this telomerase to re-elongate the ends of your chromosome as part of cellular repair. And as they get the length of those repeats, of those sections of DNA telomeres get shorter, it's associated with all sorts of um, aging, negative outcomes, disease, all of that, right? Right. It's a proxy for a deterioration of health in a variety of ways, as well as potentially related to longevity overall. Mm -hmm. It's a very complex story because they're not all cells have the same levels of telomerase. And if you have way too much telomerase, it's part of a capacity for cells to become immortal, and that is involved in cancer. Mm. So so there's uh, Goldilocks ranges uh, of, of having this right amount of mm -hmm. telomerase. It was also the case that we found the folks whose sense of purpose decreased at the end of three months. You know, you could come into a retreat with all kinds of expectations of where you're going to be at the end of three months. And then at the end of three months, it's it's you. <laughs> what is it? John Kabat-Zinn's book, Wherever You Go, There You Are. Mm -hmm. So maybe your sense of purpose didn't in, get enhanced or your neuroticism didn't change because it's also inverse. Mm. Less neurotic individuals at the end of the retreat also had increased telomerase. Mm. relative to people whose change in neuroticism was smaller. So we have to ask the question, what about telomeres? We weren't able to answer that in the Shamata project. And so we actually did a whole other massive study looking at two one-month-long retreats at Spirit Rock Meditation Center. Mm -hmm. Quinn Conklin is the first author of a paper in Brain Behavior and Immunity that describes uh, this study. So the, the bottom line is we found that telomere length increased in just three weeks at the average level of, you know, the, the average of retreat group compared to a control group that was matched on meditation experience, but not in retreat. Hmm. When we looked at individual difference measures, what was really interesting is that people who entered the retreat who were most neurotic, that is to say they easily irritable, making sort of mountains out of molehills, or people who were disagreeable, hmm. they had the largest biological increase in telomere length. Hmm. The least neurotic, most agreeable people, no change. How oh, interesting. And if you tell this to meditation teachers, they say, well, of course. Sure. Take someone where people piss them off and you go into a place where not only do you not talk to each other, you don't even have eye contact. You are left alone. Or daily life, the, the, the sitter is late, some the delivery didn't come on time. You know, daily life yeah. travails. You get three square a day, you get you live by the gong, you're in a beautiful environment, you're not with your family, you're not with your work colleagues, you're just care for yourself and its basic needs. You can just breathe easier. So many things can be nourished. Again, is it meditation or is it retreat experience? Right. Because it's such a um, contrived 
environment to be on retreat. It's it's very it's not anything you would encounter in normal life. So it's its own context for sure. Well, interestingly, retreat experience may come in handy during conditions of lockdown. Mm, mm-hmm. We're actually doing a study that Quinn Conklin is uh, is in charge of that involves uh, looking at many hundreds of people and how they're using meditation to cope with the conditions of the pandemic, the stresses of the ongoingness of it. Mm-hmm. So in this one year longitudinal study, we have a blood collection at uh, one point in time. And then a year later, we send people uh, another blood collection kit where we can then analyze uh, for telomere length changes. And we, in the interim, and at this one year and beginning time points, we ask people to fill out a large number of self-report instruments, questionnaires, looking at a variety of individual psychological trait characteristics, as well as inventories of stressors and lifetime adversity and meditation experience. And in addition, we're asking people to narrate in their own words Mm. how they are using their contemplative practice in the context of coping uh, with the conditions of the pandemic. Um, And so currently we are in the uh, midst of the one-year follow-up data collection point. And as we all know and have so much experience at this point, the conditions of the pandemic keep changing, and they've also been associated with times of great uh, social unrest and uh, impacts of racialized violence. Mm -hmm. And because the pandemic's conditions have uh, been associated with such disproportionate impact on marginalized communities, we felt it really important to recruit as diverse a population in this study as we could. Mm. In the retreat centers in which we've been working, those populations have been um, primarily white, and we needed to broaden our capacity uh, and understanding of how to recruit uh, individuals from more diverse backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So we've actually used this study as an opportunity to understand ways in which our research materials, our presentation of our projects, and the communities that we reach need to shift in order to become more inclusive. And um, this has been a transformative process, I think, for our entire group. Mm. Can you say more about what you've learned from doing this kind of work? Sure. So I think that this experience of doing work required to recruit a more diverse study population has impacted us both personally and structurally changed the way we regard uh, the culture of of research in some profound ways. Mm. And the first of those ways is to shift us from a position of sensing that we are the authoritative entity that knows how to interpret the results of individuals uh, sharing with us their experience. And we've moved more to a sense of deep collaboration and acknowledgement of the necessity for there to be uh, an ongoing dialogue between the kinds of tools that scientists use to try to answer their research questions and the lived experience of those individuals they seek to understand better. At a personal level, the degree to which my sense of authority has fallen on the rocky shoals of understanding a little bit of how little I actually understand of others. And particularly when we're speaking about the experience of marginalized groups who have experienced trauma and discrimination and life conditions that are very far from my own personal experience. So by involving our team 
with a community of participants and sharing even before they became involved in this study, our goals and getting to know their questions and concerns, we began to shift our stance towards this entire enterprise of doing human subjects research, toward one of greater intellectual, scientific, and personal inclusivity, independent of the question that we're investigating. I've been thinking as we've been chatting about the difficulties in communicating the nuance of this kind of information, particularly around the research results, um, to the public. And, um, you know, I've heard you just in this conversation be very careful, right, about caveats and nuances as, as scientists should be. And at the same time, of course, there's a challenge um, when you get really into the weeds and sometimes you can lose people, right, who aren't in the weeds with you. So that makes me think about, um, yeah, this issue of of the media coverage of this kind of work. And you and I have both witnessed, you know, this arc over the last five plus years of this type of research being covered so much more in the media and, you know, mindfulness, contemplative work, how it applies to people's lives, what the science says about it. Um, I know you've had a lot of thoughts um, about this type of communication. Um, so I'm just wondering what you think the role of the media should be right now. What kind of outcomes should they be covering? How should they be approaching this, uh, maybe compared to to the way that it has unfolded? So I think that the public communication of science often doesn't highlight the distinction between the lived experience of scientists and the craft of doing science from the caricature of science that comes along with textbook presentations of what are often dogmatic statements that are taken as delivered truth. Mm -hmm. And to me, more important than simplifying a scientific result for producing a sensation of understanding in the audience is reaching for a sense of empathy with the scientist (laughs) and what they face. And when I say what they face, this life of doing research shares an enormous amount with all creative pursuits, which includes the inherent choices of what to study, with what method, to what ends, within what current worldview. There isn't a tension on that aspect of a life in science. And I think if there was, it would be easier to communicate that our currency is fundamentally clouds of unknowing rather than firm facts, Mm. particularly in the realm of the human cognitive sciences, Mm -hmm. and especially in the realm of contemplative science, because we're studying often an extraordinarily amorphous phenomenon. Sometimes I liken it to imagine you want to know the consequences of playing a musical instrument and you're giving people violins without any strings. Mm. And they're going to hold the violins. And then your job is to uh, (laughs) assess what is music making doing (laughs) uh, to these people's body minds. Mm. We fundamentally do not know what movements of mind, so to speak, are engaged in when someone undertakes 
an instructed practice. Mm -hmm. We make assumptions about good faith, goodwill, respect for a conscientious attempt. But over time, one leaves the pavement. You know, this becomes improvisational. It becomes incorporated. The goals are not rigid repetition, mm -hmm. but development. And development means what? It's, it's kind of like... I think of a Giacometti portrait, which is an extraordinary book about how Giacometti painted the, the writer, has sat for him, and he just kept painting over and over the portrait across like two months. Mm. He just wasn't getting it, wasn't getting it, wasn't getting it. That is kind of our predicament. So we have a culture that is wanting to accept received wisdom in bite-sized pieces that we can oblige at everyone's detriment, I think. Mm. Because unless we say, ah, but this didn't happen for everybody, and it happened under these conditions, and it doesn't mean it'll happen this way if you do the same thing, and it happened at this point in history when people were motivated because of X, Y, and Z, and not in five years mm -hmm. because of other contexts. So I always come back to Francisco's statement in Monte Grande, I think. There's an excerpt from a video that Joan Halifax was interviewing him in 19, I think, 83. Maybe it was 86, I don't remember. Where he says, in its core, in its living core, science is pure contemplation. It has nothing to do with manipulation. And by manipulation, that means application, technology, instrumentality. We're going to prove if you do this training, you're going to get that result. That is not what we are committing our efforts to. Mm. We're committing our efforts to, if you do this, what do you get? And what does what you get look like in the broad communication of differences, of variability, there's a huge tension between wanting to state the mean effect and the variability. We do not spend enough time talking about the strength of effects, effect size. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are going to a gym and you're going to lift weights because of the biomechanics and the biochemistry of muscle, if you work your myocytes to fatigue and damage, they will rebuild stronger. That metaphor is not the same for if you exercise your brain muscle, <laughs> but it's used. Yeah. You have to keep also in mind one of the things that Dalai Lama said in 1990. He said, most Westerners practicing meditation practice dullness. I think Richie in the podcast talked about analytical meditation. Mm -hmm. When you have... Uh, presence of standardized instructions without engagement with a teacher, whether it's an app or whether it's a video or whether it's any method published in an appendix of a book, there isn't an opportunity for the nuanced dialogical engagement where someone can say, huh, this is what I observed when I did this. Or I keep wanting to feel better, but doing this mindfulness business, I actually feel worse. Mm. So you stop doing it rather than say, ah, maybe feeling worse is midway to saying, I feel. And there's some flux to, is it pleasant? Is it unpleasant? Does it change when I sit with it? I mean, all of this stuff, which is sort of part and parcel what you would engage with with a teacher is often not accessible. And likewise, in the presentation of science with a reporter, on deadline with 200 words for an audience, I've talked to a lot of reporters, and I consistently say, can you ask your editor for more time? Mm -hmm. Or we deal with, please put these caveats in, and then the editor takes them out. Because eyeballs on ads is the metric right. for success in the print 
publication. Right. So it's back to what is the level of discourse that is in, alive in society, and that gets back to the education system and what are the cultural norms for the realm of ideas. And on top of it, scientists have often retreated to jargon and to not considering the stakes. I think there are, are huge stakes because I believe that the communication of the wealth of reality and its complexity and nuance can be a deeply connected organic path to meaning in life. I come from the Sputnik generation, you know, in 1958 I was in kindergarten. Hmm. The Russians had launched a satellite. Suddenly space was everywhere. Science, physics, the cosmos. Mr. Wizard was on TV and we lived for this. And there has been a real shift in a sense of public education. And now it's coming back with an emphasis on training people in STEM mm -hmm. and legitimating that as a, a path. Mm -hmm. And often in that emphasis, there's an unfortunate diminution of the humanities. Right. And we're living in a not necessarily better world through technology from the consequences of social media. The things that were designed to connect us now are the things that are most potently keeping us apart. Yeah. And we are the product of that machine, our attention, our sense of autonomy. Conversation about free will gets really interesting when you think about likes on Facebook mm -hmm. or views on Instagram and the illusion of autonomy in saying, yes, that's what I want to see next, mm -hmm. where the algorithm has provided you with what it calculated you would want to think mm -hmm. was what you wanted <laughs> to see next. So I think it's an incredible challenge to make this gesture, this communicative gesture that causes someone to go, huh, I actually do think about large philosophical issues, but I don't call them that. I do wonder how much of my aspirations are the product of conditioning. All of this cultural impact on what is my formation can at moments be glimpsed as the water I'm in. There are gaps in everyone's experience, I think, where there's a higher order question. Mm. In the context of immediate acute suffering, there is a need often for a framework that someone can hang simple understanding on, that can move them off self-hatred and self-condemnation and provide a way of externalizing their immediate circumstance into an explanatory framework that doesn't put it all on them. That process is necessary and it's fraught because one needs to, at a calmer moment, say, hmm, that was helpful to you then. You should know that that was like a little toy mm -hmm. explanation. Right. But we are all embedded in toy explanations of one kind or another, and we function on the basis of iterative refinement of models that are always going to be models mm -hmm. of how nature is. So in that sense, the conversation can be about where can we move the set point for the sophistication of the models so that maybe new thoughts arise. I love that. I really appreciate how, you know, you're always a champion for the mystery. And um, you really shine a light on the interdependence and complexity of all the systems that we find ourselves embedded in and that, that we are whatever we call a self anyway. <laughs> um, we haven't even touched on that. But 
Yeah, which is the, you know, the true reality, I think, of, of this complexity. And then the acknowledgement that all we have in some ways are stories and these kind of shorthand ways of making sense of it. And you said the, the gist, getting the gist, right? Just making, which I love. I think the key just being to be aware and acknowledge that these are the stories and the gist and, and still keep an eye on that mystery and complexity. Yeah, I agree. Well, this has been so fantastic and I wish we had more time. I really appreciate your generosity with your time. I think just in closing, I'm wondering if you have, looking back over your arc of, of experience in this domain, kind of big picture take-homes or lessons learned or anything you want to share with the audience from your perspective. So I, I think one of the things that I, I want to touch on is that this uh, perpetual bend in the river of my life that Mind and Life has helped foster continues. Um, and one of the opportunities that I was afforded that helped coalesce how all, all of this lands for me was a remarkable meeting I had the privilege of being part of organizing uh, and attending in Botswana mm. on uh, Ubuntu and Boto, this uh, indigenous African notion of what it is to be a human through our relations with others. Desmond Tutu has popularized that I am because you are. Mm -hmm. uh, a person is a person through persons is another way of saying it. And this view ha I've heard represented through multiple indigenous traditions of deep acknowledgement of our embeddedness with each other and with our world, our physical world, the earth. And it makes perfect sense that under circumstances where we are dependent upon each other for survival, which we've gotten so far away from having that as immediate experience, mm. that the true connections that we have with each other that are often not conscious, not palpable, are the things that define who we are. And so in understanding what we bring to the world as the collection of loves and influences and connections that we are, we have an enormous individual responsibility. This is the tear-making moment of this moment in cultural history and in physical history, in the Anthropocene. How we choose to spend our time, the resources we consume, as Matthew Ricard says, the heart print we bring forward, is of enormous consequence. And we are not good at seeing that enormity because we seem not to be able to see all of our embeddedness. So if we foreground our embeddedness, then we can think about how the ramifications of actions ripple in the world. Mm. Thank you, Cliff. So appreciate you and all that you bring to this field and um... This has been a joy, and I hope that we can continue the conversation because there's clearly so much more to chat about. Thank you so much, and it's really been just a delight, a total delight to, to spend this time with you and inquiry together, Wendy. This episode was edited and produced by me and Phil Walker. Music on the show is from Blue Dot Sessions and Universal. Show notes and resources for this and other episodes can be found at podcast.mindandlife.org. If you enjoyed this episode, 
please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share it with a friend. If something in this conversation sparked insight for you, we'd love to know about it. You can send an email or voice memo to podcast at mindandlife.org. Mind and Life is a production of the Mind and Life Institute. Visit us at mindandlife.org, where you can learn more about how we bridge science and contemplative wisdom to foster insight and inspire action towards flourishing. There, you can also support our work, including this podcast. Thank you.